if one day, deep into the future, aliens might arrive like this plane is now, coming down on a UFO and try and disinter all of human history, the airport might be a place for them to concentrate their energies. The airport contains so much about modern life, consumerism, environmental threat, technology, and of course, transportation. This is the Hobart International Airport. It's not really an international airport, perhaps the name is aspirational. Hobart International Airport. It's the main entrance and exit to Tasmania has the most picturesque approach in the country and each year under normal circumstances two million passengers pass through the gateway. This is what it looks like now. And this is what it looked like when it first opened. In the 1940s commercial air flight was all the rage and it was very much coming to Tasmania. The federal government purchased 1,250 acres of privately owned land at Laherne Estate in Cambridge and it officially opened in June 1956. When it opened, it replaced the neighbouring Cambridge Aerodrome. Also known as the Cambridge Airport and still in minor use today, this is what it looked like in the 1940s. The site was the primary location for aeronautics in Hobart going back to the 1920s, the time before security protocols. The airport bus drove onto the tarmac to drop off and collect passengers. This is the view from inside the Cambridge Airport Control Tower, a place that saw a fateful departure. So we're down here on the beach. It's like a lot of the beaches around Hobart. I kind of look like this in a way. It's pretty windy. There's another plane coming in. You wouldn't know it today. But in March 1946, one evening, a plane came down, not like that one, not safely. Something very bad happened. Australian National Airways was the country's predominant aerial carrier. During the 1940s, ANA was plagued by a series of accidents. One of their main planes in use was the Douglas DC-3. On Sunday the 10th of March, 1946, the aircraft registered VHAET was due to make a return flight to Essendon in Victoria at 4.50 p.m. But it was delayed and did not depart until 8.50 p.m. On board were 21 passengers, three pilots and an air hostess. Takeoff was into light southerly wind towards Frederick Henry Bay. Observers at the aerodrome reported that everything was normal. Witnesses at Seven Mile Beach estimated the aircraft reached a height of 400 feet before turning left slightly and descending steeply. The plane cleared the land before falling into the water 300 yards from the shore. The plane stayed in the air less than two minutes. Immediately after going down, people rushed to Seven Mile Beach to look for survivors. Just after 11 p.m., the rear fuselage came to the surface a short distance offshore. An airline employee who feared that an air hostess was trapped in her seat at the rear of the fuselage decided he had to do something. Taking a length of rope, he swam out to the floating wreckage and lassoed a knot around the tailwheel. A motor lorry, back on the beach, went into low gear and dragged the metal ashore. But there was no one inside. Human remains in various conditions began to wash ashore that night and into the following days. One body was found at Sanford, five miles away. A total of 21 bodies were recovered, with four never to be found. Two years later, a human thigh bone was discovered on Seven Mile Beach. Police suspected that it had belonged to one of the victims. The Argus was an Australian morning newspaper in Melbourne that was in print from 1946 to 1957. News travelled more slowly in the past. This was their front page two days after the crash, as the media 
was attempting to put the story together. A true narrative would, however, remain elusive. It was a time before the invention of flight data and cockpit voice recorders. A civil aviation panel was unable to define a conclusion. The plane itself appeared to have been mechanically sound, but perhaps one of the mechanisms had been misused. What they did uncover was that the pilot had diabetes and had in fact been discharged from the RAAF years earlier because of it, deemed unfit to fly. Perhaps more strangely again, a local ornithologist said that he had been shown the remains of a gannet bird about the time of the crash, and he had classified its injuries as consistent with having struck a hard moving object, such as a plane. The exact causes for the crash are an unresolvable speculation. With 25 deaths, there were zero survivors. The Tasmanian DC-3 disaster was, up until that time, the worst air crash in Australian history.